Welcome to the 700 Club. A school board meeting rated X. Lewd passages read out loud by parents up in arms. So what's the source of these jaw-dropping words? They're assigned reading for students in the ninth grade. Well, what's going on in Virginia's Loudoun County schools? And whose heads may roll because of it? Tara Mergener reveals the outrageous detail behind this explosive scandal. Loudoun County had already become ground zero for a number of national debates, mainly because parents are making noise. A warning, what you're about to hear is offensive. Every time she made too much noise, I'd walk in and kick her. Jasper wasn't even my boyfriend, just this dude I did some hacking with once in a while. It's okay. It's cool. This is what girls do at parties. Those jaw-dropping words read by mothers from books recommended to students in Loudoun County Public Schools. Now a move to recall some school board members may be gaining steam. Ian Pryor says the Loudoun County School Board is abusing its power. But when it comes to parents that want answers to what their kids are being taught or not taught in school, they, ha they have no answers. Pryor is among a growing number of frustrated parents forming the Fight for Schools Political Action Committee. We're going to talk about the need for change in the Loudoun County School Board. Collecting about 2,500 signatures so far aimed at unseating several board members, accused of using a secret Facebook page to target parents who oppose them. They're looking to push material or, or thoughts into a school system and less focus on you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. School board meetings often boiling over. Last week, several angry moms took it up a notch, shocking the crowd by holding up signs and reading aloud sexually explicit passages from books on the high school reading list. Another word of warning, what you're about to hear is offensive. I grab her by the neck and start punching her. He had a big and sometimes a girl just needs a big his pants around his ankles squeezed between April's straddled legs as she lay on top of a teacher's desk. How did we get these un unacceptable topics? Well, one, you didn't follow your procurement policies when you bought $1.8 million worth of these trash books. Interim Superintendent Scott Ziegler declined CBN's request for an interview. The only school board member who answered our calls told CBN she could not speak for other members, but that she did not read the material in question, nor are members required to do so. On another sensitive subject, the district denies Loudoun's so-called equity plan is a disguise for getting critical race theory into classrooms. This mother, though, doesn't buy it. CRT is racist. It is abusive. It discriminates against one's color. We don't want your political advertisement to divide our children or belittle them. Ziegler describes the district's equity priorities as an effort to provide a welcoming, inclusive, affirming environment for all students. Meanwhile, Pryor is hoping backlash here will also inspire other communities to fight back. This country was founded on the ability of people to disagree. And what we're seeing in Loudoun County Public Schools is that there is no room for disagreement with their agenda. Recall efforts are rarely successful in Virginia, most failing to get the required signatures or getting dismissed by the judge for insufficient evidence. But Pryor believes these board members are in for a rude awakening. Tara Mergener, CBN News. Just think, ladies and gentlemen, Loudoun County, Loudoun County in Virginia has the highest per capita income of any county in the United States. Why? Because so many government workers are there. And somehow the left has come over and taken over the state of Virginia. It has been unbelievable how a formerly conservative state has turned, you know, as, as uh, whatever blue, red, whatever, whatever the color is, yes. it has totally shifted. And now there's a big fight for the governor and, and one of the Republicans who's running is using this Loudoun County school as a as a as a poster boy of what can happen in Virginia. It is unbelievable. This is the state where Harry Byrd reigned, where it was conservative for so many years. Lindsay Allman and all these people who were the heads of the state. And in a short period of time, a small group, because of Washington, Washington 
has so many liberals in the District of Columbia, and they moved into Loudoun County, and they've got so much money, and they have done some horrible things. But maybe, maybe, maybe this is a bellwether, and people are looking to Virginia because if this state flips back the way it used to be, then it'll be a, a, a wake-up call, if you, sir, if you will, for the rest of the nation. But Loudoun County, can you imagine on the, on the edge of Washington, D.C., in northern Virginia, doing this horrible and, and, and assigning pornographic literature for children to read in the ninth grade? And calling it education. Oh, it's, it's astounding. And then, of course, they're trying to put in the critical race theory as well. And uh, it's just the beginning of what's being done. But I, I remember uh, if the statement I read years and years ago, where one educator said, so what if Johnny can't read? We've got him till he gets to be 16 years old. So the whole idea was to indoctrinate children and to move him into a le leftward course. And if they can't read and write and spell, it's just tough luck. And now that they've got a whole new math program they want to put in the schools, and our children will be so far behind uh, the other uh, nations of the earth unless we do something about it. But <clears throat> Loudoun County, keep your eyes on Virginia this next election. Well, in other news, rotating judges, mandatory retirement, and adding more justices to the Supreme Court, all are part of President Biden's commission to, quote, study the high court. But is any of this constitutional? John Jessup has that. Thanks, Pat. President Biden's Commission on Reforming the Supreme Court met for the first time Wednesday. One big question on their plate, should the number of justices be expanded beyond the current nine seats? CBN's George Thomas has this look at the proceedings and conservative reaction. America has had nine justices on the Supreme Court since 1869. But now that conservatives hold a 6-3 to three majority on the high court, some Democratic lawmakers and liberal groups say it's out of balance and needs to be fixed. The court's illegitimate far-right majority, installed through hyper-partisan political schemes, will put even settled precedents on our rights at risk. Liberal groups like Demand Justice, among those pushing a Democratic bill to so-called pack the court. President Biden is not a fan of packing the court, but he announced the commission to study expanding and altering the Supreme Court. On Wednesday, 36 members of the commission met for the first time virtually. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And I will, I will support, support and defend, defend the Constitution, Constitution of, the of the United States. States. To discuss reforming the high court. The commission, made up of dozens of scholars and activists, mostly liberal and some conservatives, met to lay the groundwork for the group's agenda. We definitely have our work cut out for us. The idea of expanding the number of justices getting the most attention. We plan to look, as others have indicated, not only at current proposals, but also proposals about membership and size that have been floated at other times in American history. The commission will also explore if Congress has the power to reverse Supreme Court rulings and whether justices should serve on the bench for life. We're going to look at the justices' length of service and how frequently the court's membership should turn over. And this is going to include proposals for term limits and mandatory retirement. Conservatives have blasted Biden's proposal to overhaul the high court. After all, Biden in 1982 said packing the court was, quote, a bonehead idea. There's not a problem on the court. The only problem is that the left for years has relied upon the judiciary to do its bidding. Senator Lindsey Graham telling CBN's Abigail Robertson that all that changed when President Trump put three conservative judges on the bench, tilting it in their favor. And the goal of the liberal left is to stack it with liberals to undercut the conservative majority that all of us have worked so hard to obtain through the right process. The group will hold several more meetings over the next six months before giving the president their analysis. George Thomas, CBN News. Thanks, George. Pat, this issue sparking heated debate. Back in history, in the 1930s, uh, President Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, put forth a very uh, 
aggressive agenda to bring America out of the Depression. And uh, it was a rather uh, interesting proposal, but he wanted to have a National Recovery Administration. He wanted uh, all these various other r r rules and agencies. Well, the court continually ruled that many of those New Deal uh, initiatives were unconstitutional. So Roosevelt, who had a powerful uh, stand in the, in the public and had both houses of Congress on his side, they were both Democrats, both the, the majority of the House and majority of the Senate, and Roosevelt said, okay, what I'm going to do is appoint five new judges to the court, and that will balance off the ones who are voting against my programs, and therefore the New Deal legislation will no longer be ruled unconstitutional. Well, when he did that, there was an outcry in the, in the country, and both houses of Congress, though they were his party, voted against it because they thought this was an outrage to take away the court. And, you know, when you go way back to the case that I first learned about in law school, Marbury versus Madison, uh, the, the whole thought was the chief judge then said Congress, I mean, the, the courts had the power to review acts of Congress. Now what these liberals want to do is to reverse that and say Congress has the power to overturn the ruling of the Supreme Court. Well, we have three bodies that make up our country. We have the executive, the president, we have the legislative, which is the Congress, and we have the judiciary. And now the, the Democrats, when they, when they are losing power, they want to control it all. They, they think, well, we've got the presidency, we have the Congress, now we want the courts. We want to take all three, and then we can put through our socialist agenda. Folks, don't let them do it, because it's wrong. John? Pat, Congress is taking a step towards investigating the January 6th incursion of the Capitol. The House voted to establish a commission to investigate the facts and influencing factors leading to that January mob attack on the U.S. Capitol building. 35 House Republicans voted in favor. However, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell opposed the commission, as does former President Donald Trump, who still holds considerable influence in the party. It is unclear if the measure will pass the Senate, where it will need 10 Republican votes. Well, turning now to the escalating violence between Israel and Hamas, there are reports from both sides on progress towards a ceasefire agreement that could possibly go into effect by the weekend. This as the United States stepped up pressure on Israel. President Biden telling Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu Wednesday that he, quote, expected to see significant de-escalation today on the path to a ceasefire. The fighting did let up overnight with Israeli forces carrying out fewer strikes on Gaza. Rocket, rocket attacks from Gaza into Israel also decreased. While Hamas has launched more than 4,000 rockets at southern Israel, more than 90 percent intercepted by the Iron Dome anti-missile system. As CBN's Chris Mitchell reports from central Israel, Iron Dome is saving lives on both sides of the conflict. In just over a week, close to 4,000 rockets have forced some 4 million Israelis into bomb shelters. As they seek cover, an aerial battle takes place in the sky, with Israel's Iron Dome providing an amazing layer of protection. Behind me is one of the many Iron Dome anti-missile systems here in south and central Israel. During the conflict with Hamas and other terror groups, the Iron Dome has shot down more than 90 percent of the rockets coming out of the Gaza Strip. Imagine yourself that those 90 percent rockets that were intercepted were, would be falling into our cities. CBN News met one of the men responsible for creating this technological marvel, retired General Daron Gavish. Through cooperation and funding from the U.S., Israel developed the anti-missile system 10 years ago. It's the technological equivalent of a bullet hitting a bullet. Ten years ago, it was only the beginning. We had to kind of invent the wheel because there is no other place in the world that something like this is going on. This viral picture literally seen round the world captured the essence of the Iron Dome. On the right side, you see rockets fired from Gaza. Then on the left side, 
Iron Dome shoots them down. I see, first of all, the willingness of the Hamas to throw rockets into our cities. This is something untolerable, and this is something that we cannot accept. I think neither us and neither any democracy in the world. CBN News experienced the effectiveness of the Iron Dome when we took shelter from a rocket attack and heard the Iron Dome intercept two missiles overhead. General Gavish sees it as a true lifesaver on both sides of the fight. Many believe without Iron Dome, Israel would have been forced into a ground war with potentially massive casualties. By the end of the day, we could look in the mirror and we could say we did something for the defense of Israel, we did something for our civilians, and we're saving life. And this is what the air defense is doing. Chris Mitchell at an Iron Dome anti-missile battery, Central Israel. Thanks, Chris. Pat? Back to you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say as, as strongly as is possible, you know, we cannot allow the left in Congress, uh, that the so-called squad, to take away our robust defense of Israel. Israel is the only real democracy in the Middle East. They are a bastion of freedom. And they're like having a forward aircraft carrier out in the midst of a troubled sea. And uh, people are crying out for the fact, well, um, they must de-escalate. They've got to stop this. Well, Israel has got to do something about Gaza to stop them from sending rockets. And Hamas has taken over Gaza. And I talked to Chris the other day, they, apparently it's not wise for Israel to start a ground war to, you know, take the Hamas out of Gaza because it would just be too bloody and too costly. But at the same time, we, they cannot be pulled back from defending themselves. Just imagine, as one person said, what would happen if we were having rocket attacks in New York City coming across the border from Canada? What would we do? Well, we would not let it happen. And Israel should not have to ha let it happen either. So. Behind the Iron Dome, that's one thing, but Israel needs to be allowed to, to have airstrikes against Hamas targets. And it looks painful, and it looks uh, bloody in a sense, but they have a right to self-defense, and we should stand behind them for that. Epidemic of exhaustion. That's what millions of Americans are facing, even millennials. So what's the source of this energy crisis? And something deep inside, medical reporter Lori Johnson has an explanation. Americans are dealing with a new kind of energy crisis. Fatigue and tiredness now is an epidemic in this country. Um, well over 50% of people actually complain of chronic tiredness, and that includes millennials. And that's certainly not our experience in years past. What's changed? According to Dr. Stephen Gundry, author of The Energy Paradox, what to do when your get up and go has got up and gone, it's all about looking inside ourselves. More people have an unhealthy gut today than in the past. And that's the primary cause of our energy crisis. Two o'clock in the afternoon, um, all of a sudden, kind of all systems seem to go on pause. You don't feel like working anymore. You don't feel like doing anything with the kids anymore. And you just want to lay down or you know, reach for an energy bar, or get another, you know, pick me up a cup of coffee. Dr. Gundry says this zaps our energy because of holes that develop in the gut lining. If you're tired and fatigued, you got leaky gut. And that leaking causes inflammation, which can drain huge amounts of our precious energy. Inflammation is actually our white blood cells, our immune system, our foot soldiers, if you will, attacking threats that actually come into our body primarily through the lining of our gut. The good news is we can repair a leaky gut and reverse other gut issues by consuming lots of different types of good bacteria called probiotics, then feeding those good bacteria lots of fiber-rich foods called prebiotics, causing the bacteria to thrive and multiply.
These probiotics can be found in supplements, foods like yogurt and kimchi, and drinks like kombucha. Then it's important to take so-called prebiotics, found in supplements or foods like fresh vegetables. These literally feed the good bacteria, helping it reproduce. They actually communicate to the energy-producing organelles in all of our cells called the mitochondria to make more energy. So probiotics that you manufacture by eating prebiotics literally turbocharges your energy. And it's also important to stay away from foods that deplete energy. That includes the usual suspects of too much sugar and processed foods, which can also damage the gut. Gundry further recommends resisting the temptation to over-medicate. Please, please, please try to avoid taking antibiotics for simple things like runny noses or scratchy throats. Try to avoid eating animals that have been raised with antibiotics from factory farms. It turns out antibiotics kill off most of the good bugs in our intestines that actually protect us from leaky gut. And don't take certain heartburn and acid indigestion medicines longer than two weeks. We now know that these actually stop the energy-producing organelles, the mitochondria, from working because they interrupt how uh, mitochondria produce energy, which is called proton pumping. Dr. Gundry says people suffering from low energy usually need more vitamin D. He recommends a 5,000 IU daily supplement and going outside. We actually produce ATP energy from sunlight exposure. Lastly, in order to feel energetic during the day, we need a good night's sleep. However, blue light coming from our electronics can keep us from falling asleep. Dr. Gundry recommends turning them off hours before bedtime or wearing blue light blocking glasses. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Uh, thanks, Lori. Uh, Dr. Gundry's book is called The Energy Paradox. What to do when you get up and go has uh, up and gone. <laughs> and uh, that's available wherever books are sold. And there's something else we've had. It was probably the most popular thing we ever offered on this program. I have never had anything ever that we offered as good as this. It's called Build a Better Gut. And it is so important and it'll transform your life. And we'll give you this free. All you have to do is ask for it. Build a better gut is 1-800-700-7000. And it'll be our pleasure to give you a free copy if you wish, because it'll help you. Okay, Terry. One minute, John Hawkins was feeling fine. The next, he was flat on the ground. Without warning, John's hip gave out two separate times. John was in a world of hurt. The scariest part, he had no idea why. Too young to be acting like I'm 89, you know, can't move, you know, and uh, I didn't like it. At 60 years young, John Hawkins, a retired carpenter turned pastor, couldn't believe he needed a cane to get around. I was always active, uh, liked to work, uh, work with my hands. Uh, my mom was a good example of work. A lot of good work ethic in my family. Everybody worked all their life. Always worked for what you want. The problem was his hip. It had started years earlier when he moved back to Los Angeles to care for his cancer-stricken mother. Shortly after, without warning, he fell to the ground twice. And I stayed there for a minute, trying to understand it. It scared me to death because I didn't trip over anything. My hip just gave out. I didn't understand why. An orthopedic specialist recommended John undergo hip surgery. Brought the results back and showed me that my tendon where the bone go was gone. I'm bone against bone. I need a new hip. Eventually, John declined the surgery after reading about problems with some of the replacement hips on the market. By then, the pain was so debilitating, his wife Rose even had to help him with simple tasks, like putting on his shoes and socks. It, it, it felt so bad, I didn't want to move. I was agitated, angry, real quick. I only wanted to move and go outside when I had to. John knew his only hope was through prayer. But the pain got so excruciating to where I said, well, you know, that's part of prayer. And God healed me before.
So let me try this. That went on for about a year when one night John was watching the 700 Club. Terry and Pat were praying. Yeah, there's someone, um, you, you've been praying for a long time about something with the Lord. I don't really know what this is. I don't know if it's physical, financial, psychological, whatever, but God is in the midst of changing your situation and begin to thank and praise the Lord before you even see what's being done. John believed that he was that someone. But I said, Lord, I'm going to touch and agree with them. I'm going to pray and add my hand on my hip. I'm going to believe this healing. And all of a sudden, oh, by the way, call us. It was time to go off the air. So I just cut the TV off. They thank you, Lord, and went to bed. I had tears in my heart and joy in my body because of the fact I was praying with Pat and Terry, and it felt so good. He didn't think about it again until two weeks later when he realized he didn't need his wife's help or have any pain. So one day we were fit to go to church, and the wife went to uh, put my grab on my shoes, and I said, wait a minute, these last two weeks, I haven't had no pain in my hip. And I said, in fact, I was getting in and out of the bathtub, lifting my leg by itself. I said, I came in and said, wait a minute, the last time I had pain was the day before I watched Pat Robinson and Terry, and I prayed and laid hands, and I touched and agreed with them. That pain was gone that night. It was gone so fast. Everything was normal, like I never had pain at all. I didn't even realize it for two weeks. I said, oh my God, my God. I started praising them. I fell on my knees and started crying. John has been loving his active, pain-free life ever since. I'm totally healed, and I thank God for it, you know, and God is awesome. Just can't give enough praise. Can't give enough praise. Isn't that wonderful? That, my friends, was a creative miracle. He was bone on bone, ligament gone, Amazing. Uh, and, and God restored yeah. what had been taken. Just as we prayed together. Yes. It's amazing. amazing. All right, well, you've got something. I do. This is Roberta. She c contacted us by email, Pat, and said on Tuesday, 700 Club Prayer Time, you, Pat, got a word for someone named Roberta who yes. had a neck injury in the past and God was healing it. She said, I immediately reached up and touched my neck. I knew this was my time. You see, I was injured years ago and have suffered with severe back pain and had to undergo few of my spine. Several years now, my cervical vertebrae have caused terrible nerve pain. Through many tears and prayers, this was my day for a miracle, <laughs> and I claimed it. I am healed by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. Isn't that marvelous? Yes. And yes. I, I didn't know Roberta, but God did, and He know, knew who she was. And All right, Lori, who lives in Irving, Texas, started suffering two years ago with kidney issues. For the past year, the pain was acute. Laurie was watching this program on April the 8th of this year, heard uh, Terry say, somebody with kidney dysfunction, God's healing that condition, you will not need surgery. Laurie called the CBN prayer line on April the 16th and was thrilled to report that her kidney pain is gone. Now, folks, as we have said many times, God is no respecter of persons. And with God, all things are possible. There was a man who said to Jesus, said, if you can, and Jesus said, it's kind of like, if I can, if you can believe, all things are possible. Now, we're going to join hands together, and what I ask you to do is to pray with us. Thank you, Jesus. Nothing is impossible. Father, how we thank you for these miracles that we hear on a day-to-day -day basis, because you are a sovereign God. And all things are possible with the God we serve. Thank you, Lord. There's somebody whose name's Charles or Charlie. You've got curvature of the spine, and uh, it's kind of like scoliosis, but not quite. And right now, God, you're going to feel fingers going up and down your spine, and everything is lining up, and you will be sitting straight in the name of Jesus. Touch him, Terry. Someone else, you've been in an accident where you've had acid burns. Um, they've been disfiguring and, of course, very painful. God's healing all of that for Thank you, you right Jesus. now. Restoration for you in Thank Jesus' you, name. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord, and thank you in the name of Jesus for all of your goodness and all of your power. Someone uh, else with ulcers in your mouth that just yeah. never go away. God's healing that Thank condition you, for you right now. 
somebody has what's called a fatty liver, and it just you just need to change your diet. But right now, God is going to heal it, and then everything in your in your life is going to become better. You talk about a surge of energy; you're going to have it. Thank you, Lord. Terry, something else? Someone else with an ear infection, uh, not going away for a long time. Right now, in Jesus' name, your ear is healed. Uh, there's somebody you've got a numbness uh, in your body, and, and you've been saying, God, I feel numb. Mm. The nerves are somehow blocked. That numbness is going away. And the Lord has healed you, and you, you will feel function in that numbness in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Now, Lord, for all those who pray and are seeking God with us, we ask for the anointing of the Spirit to come, bring forth miracles that Thank Jesus you. Christ might be exalted in His name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Folks, as always, we love to hear the answers. We love to have your prayer requests. So pick up the phone, call in. Somebody's here. Who cares? It's 1-800-700-7000. Call in. And we'll be glad to share these wonderful things. And by the way, I want to tell you, on Wednesday of next week, we've already taken the call. So I think we the, the, the mailbox is full. <laughs> but we'll have our special Q&A show on uh, next Wednesday so that you don't want to miss that. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Republican Governor Greg Abbott signed a law banning nearly all abortions in Texas. It prevents abortions after detection of a fetal heartbeat about six weeks into pregnancy. More than a dozen other states are considering similar bills. Federal courts have blocked those measures in states where they've passed. The Supreme Court agreed this week to take up a Mississippi anti-abortion law. The case expected to be heard this fall. Some believe a ruling from the court's 6-3 conservative majority could allow more restrictions on abortion. Well, more than 10 million more Americans turned to the Bible during the COVID-19 pandemic than in years past, according to the American Bible Society. Its 2021 State of the Bible report found that 181 million Americans opened a Bible during the past year, compared to the 169 million Ameri Americans who used a Bible at least occasionally in earlier years. One in four adults said they read the Bible more frequently in 2020 than in prior years. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Saving bunnies. That's what started eight-year-old Caleb Smith on a journey that would lead to his owning a private island. So how on earth did Caleb make it happen? And how are his bunnies helping people who are hurting? Take a look. Caleb Smith is no ordinary teenager. He's an author and entrepreneur who owns and operates a 22-acre island where he trains comfort bunnies to help those in need. Welcome to Peace Bunny Island. In his book, Peace Bunny Island, Caleb shares his incredible journey of faith and how his dream of saving unwanted bunnies is changing people's lives. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Caleb Smith. Caleb, it's great to have you with us. Thank you for having me on today. You know, I'm a, I'm a bunny fan. Your first bunny was named Snickers. Tell us how Snickers changed your life. Yeah, so Snickers came into my life and it was, uh, he was raised with cats before uh, we welcomed him into our house. Um, so he actually thought he was a cat, so he used a litter box and would come up and lick your hand and was just the most sweet rabbit that uh, I had at the time and was just wonderful. And then um, we had him for a little less than a year and he sadly passed away. And around the Easter time frame, I was looking for a new pet rabbit and found uh, here in the Twin Cities metro in Minnesota that there were over 360 of them. Uh, here on Craigslist and wanted to prevent the pet abandonment cycle and focus on the education and the prevention side. Well, how did the show Shark Tank help you turn your love for bunnies into a business? Yeah, so when I pitched the idea, I walked down the hallway and I wasn't formally on Shark Tank, but it felt like it to my parents. <laughs> and I just pitched the idea to them and uh, put on my church suit and walked down the hallway and I uh, pitched this idea of um, saving the rabbits to prevention, focusing on the education about the rabbits 
and now we can focus on a biodiversity program with all these different breeds of rabbits we have in our program. Well, you're an expert now, but you're also the owner of an island. You're 16. How did you, how did you come up with that idea, and how did you afford to do it? Yeah, so at 11 years old, I had an idea um, during the Easter time frame on uh, doing the bunny garden, which is a class that we uh, hold back to back to back for uh, the weeks leading up to Easter. And out of really fatigue, uh, I just said, well, I want an island. <laughs> and uh, after the after the Easter events uh, went through, then I kind of pondered about that and thought, well, maybe an island would work. And the idea of that the rabbits won't swim off, the land predators won't get on, and the eagles will stay away if there are humans keeping an eye on the rabbits. So it's a place where we could train them to go to different places so they can share some hugs, hope, and happiness with people. So talk about what the bunnies do. You, you train them, and then they are used to bring uh, peace and, and hope to people who are in difficult situations. What do you do, and, and what, how does the bunny cause that to happen? Yes, yeah, so we bring the rabbits to many different programs and we bring them to birthday parties and senior centers and egg hunts and really anywhere that they where people want rabbits, wedding receptions, bridal showers. <laughs> uh, we, we just bring rabbits to joyous occasions. And then with the, the Peace Bunny unit on the other side, uh, we're bringing the rabbits uh, to people that are dealing with loneliness, trauma and grief. Um, so then bringing a little bit of comfort with the rabbits and we, we know that they're, they're God's bunnies and I just get to be the caretaker of it. And that's the, God gives the power to the rabbits to do the real ministry. You talk about the ministry of presence in your book. What is that? Well, it's when I talk about when we bring the rabbits out or an animal and you think of them as a comfort animal or a therapy animal, um, just the fact of having a rabbit or an animal up close um, it has what I call the, the power of presence of just how much of an impact they have. And these animals, um, they're really not judgmental and they'll just sit next to you and listen to you. And they, they're a uh, keeper of secrets and they'll, they'll listen <laughs> to what you have to say. What role did your faith play in all of this? Yeah, so it was... Faith, faith has been a really important part of both on the business life and my personal life, too, and making the commitment to follow Jesus and to follow God and that just how much of an impact he's made in my life. And he knows that um, I'm, I'm on everything that he does is uh, it's, it's his plan and that it's. It's God's divine nudges, and we just have to follow them. And mine just happened to be rabbits, but I hope <laughs> my, my memoir inspires people to find basically their Peace Bunny Island and a journey to the goals that they're striving for. Tell us about the little bunny you're holding there. Adorable. <laughs> so this is Rose, and she is one of our Angora rabbits, and they grow one inch of hair every month. So we wow. give them haircuts a few times a year and it doesn't hurt the rabbit at all. And then you can uh, take the take the hair and make yarn out of it and then you can knit with it. Yeah. How many how many varieties of rabbits do you have on Peace Bunny Island? Yeah, so at the Peace Bunny Cottage, which is where they live year round, we have 16 different breeds of rabbits. Um, and then during then when we take them out to the island for kind of their short term um, kind of summer camp for the training. Um, then we can bring uh, a few um, out there at a time. And uh, the permits change of how many we can take out there, but it's usually up to 24 at a time. Well, uh, I have two bunnies that we love, and I learned a lot that I did not know about rabbits in your book. The book is absolutely fascinating. Caleb has written a book about his adventure of faith. It's called Peace Bunny Island, and it's available wherever books are sold. Isn't that cover awesome? <laughs> Caleb, what a great story and a great work that you're doing at 16. Can't wait to see where God's going to take you with all of this. God bless you. I can't believe the miracle has happened to me. Well, that's what Laura Adams says about the way her investments are flourishing. So what's the secret to Laura's financial success? Watch. Retired consultant Laura Adams has a generous heart. She loves meeting the needs of others. Rescuing animals is also one of her passions. 
My life ministry has been about meeting the needs of humans and animals in any way I possibly can. Laura knows firsthand the blessings that come from giving. After a health crisis forced her to retire in 2019, she continued to tithe from her investment income. Laura increased the percentage she gave as her investment flourished and was amazed by the results. The checks were getting bigger and bigger, and I actually got up to about 40%, and the Lord kept on pouring blessings upon me that were so great that even to this day, I, I look back and I can't believe the miracle that's happened to me. When COVID hit in 2020, Laura saw the financial impact it made on her community. People were being fired left and right. They couldn't buy the most basic of needs. The Lord put a fire in me to want to help them in any way that I possibly could. Laura decided to increase her giving to 60% of her income. She also wanted to make sure the money she gave would go as far as possible. So she turned to CBN. As a longtime partner, she knew she could depend on CBN to make her donation count. My dollar only goes so far if I go to a store to buy a couple cans of produce. CBN has the contacts, they have the resources, the connections to take that dollar and turn it into 10. For Laura, helping others is a joy. That's why she's a member of CBN's Chairman's Circle. It's a lot of fun giving. It's way more fun to give than to receive. It always has been. I've been giving to CBN for probably about 15 years now. And I have seen clear evidence across the board where my money has impacted and made a difference. Laura hopes her generosity will motivate others to do more to help. And she encourages them to do so through partnering with CBN. I have seen how my money has impacted very, very large amounts of people. It has me completely convinced that there really is no other effective way to give than through CBN. They can make things happen that we as individuals cannot. So why shouldn't we bank our resources with an organization that has the ability to make miracles happen in the name of the Lord? Well, that's just one of the wonderful partners that keeps CBN going, and we need people just like her, and God uses them in tremendous ways, and as they give, He gives to them. Now, to be a 700 Club member, it's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day. You can't get a can of soda pop for that kind of money any longer. I mean, 65 cents just seems like pocket change. But all of us to giving together makes a great difference. Now, when you join, I want to give you something. Uh, it's called God is for us, verses of salvation, peace, and victory. And I was privileged to go into our audio room and record this for you. And it tells you how to enjoy the security and confidence of knowing that God is for you and know that you are being led by the Spirit of God. This is all yours if you join the 700 Club. So please call. We'd love to have your contribution, to have you one of our partners. 1-800-700-7000. So we got some questions now, so let's go to them. We do. This first one Pat, right. comes from William, who says, Hi, Pat. I heard someone on TV preach about how God can forgive you of your sins, but often doesn't remove the penalty of those sins. Is this really true? And if God won't remove the penalty of my past sins, is there even a point in turning my life around? Uh, well, you're looking at eternal I mean, eternity is what's really important. I mean, what happens here in this earth is, you know, minuscule compared to a life lived with God forever and ever. And Paul said, I'm just doing everything I can if I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. So you want your sins forgiven. Now, let's assume that you shoot somebody in cold blood, first degree murder. Now, when you do that, you say, God, I, I sinned against you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And God says, all right, son, daughter, I forgive you. But what is the judge going to say in the court when you get conv convicted? He's going to say, I'm sorry. It's going to be life in prison, or it may be the death chamber. That's the temporal punishment. And there are two different things. God can forgive, but the courts may not. I mean, the, what you have done may bear an impact. Uh, if you uh, do something to hurt yourself. We've been talking about health and everything. If you uh, hurt your body, God can forgive you for doing it, 
but you still might get emphysema, or you still might get, uh, <laughs> Gundy was talking about the leaky guts, you still might get that. <laughs> All right, what's the other okay. question? This is John who says, can conflicting, condemning, or incessant thoughts affect one's salvation? Should I ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior every time negative thoughts about Christianity pop up in my head, or do I just need to repent? Are persistent negative thoughts sinful in and of themselves? All right. The Bible says this, let the words of my heart, uh, uh, the words of my, my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. So what we're thinking and, uh, and what we're doing, and the Bible also says break up your fallow ground. So the time for all of us, we have to continually break up the fallow ground. We have to continue to come to the Lord. You don't have to continue to get saved. But we do, our hearts do get hardened along the way, and we do need to have times of refreshing where we uh, get right with God because these things do build up, all right? Floyd says, Pat, is America now what the Church of Sardis was? Revelation 3, 1 through 3 says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up, but if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. All right, look, there were churches of a, of, in Asia that uh, were involved in Re Revelation. All of them, by the way, are in modern-day Turkey. But uh, I, you can't just say, well, this is the church today, this is the church today. I think the one in Laodicea is closest to it, you know, but to say, well, the church is this. I mean, God didn't make me a judge, and he didn't make you a judge. And, that, and to say that, that means you're judging and saying, well, the church is like this. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe yes, maybe no. I think what we all need to do is to learn from those things. And they were all parts of, of Jesus, every one of them. And this one is uh, on fire. This is dead. This, you know, be hot or cold, or I'll vomit you out of my mouth. All those things. You find some evidence of it everywhere, okay? This is Linda who says, what exactly does amen mean? We say it at the end of every prayer. Uh, it means let it be so. Uh, that's what it means. Mm -hmm. Let it be so. Oh, amen. Yes. Okay. Beverly says, when we get to heaven, will we recognize people we know or watched on television, such as precious Ben Kenchlow? <laughs> will the ones we knew also recognize us? Does the Bible have a scripture that answers this question? Well, you, you look at Jesus talking about the, uh, the rich man and Dives and and the rich man uh, uh, was in hell. Dives was taken by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Then he looks down and he said, look, uh, uh, let me go and talk to my brothers. And, and uh, uh, Abraham said, no, there's a great gulf between us fixed. But he did recognize that I think we will know people. Uh, <laughs> I don't know necessarily. If you're in an audience of 20 million people, I'm not sure that every one of them in that audience is going to recognize you. But do you remember the little boy that wrote the book, his dad, yeah, he yeah. wrote the book? Heaven's, Heaven's for Real, Heaven. yeah. And he recognized family members and they knew who he was? Unborn, I mean, yeah. they're little children that were aborted, absolutely. Okay. Well, that's all the time we've got. But yeah, I think there's going to be recognition in heaven. That's what you're asking. Well, today's Power of Minute is from Philippians chapter 4. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. And tomorrow, we're going to tell you what big tech doesn't want you to know. Oh, it's a shocking revelation. For Terry and all of us, Pat Robertson, thank you so much for being with us. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Tomorrow. The tyranny of big tech. And these companies have unprecedented power over our lives. They're tracking your children. Building profiles of them. Twisting your minds. They absolutely are swaying votes. And silencing your voices. You can't do anything about it. Senator Josh Hawley sounds the alarm. We have to break these companies up. On the next 700 Club. The Battle for Jerusalem is now streaming in 4K. May God be with you. It is a very emotional experience. It's amazing. My heart was up here. And true. You want me to plan an entire war in two days? 
Yes? You can now own the acclaimed CBN documentary, In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem, for a gift of any dollar amount. It's important. Inspiring. Just teary-eyed. They divided the land of God. And the production value is incredible. It is a powerful documentary that should be seen and understood by every American. Dear all we the Lord is our God. You need to see this film. Everybody should see this. Get your DVD today with 4K streaming access for a gift of any dollar amount. Call 1-800-700-7000 or log on to cbn.com slash in our hands.